just uh, four minutes uh, after 12. Um, <laughs> welcome to this uh, presentation on uh, Joomla, Joomla plugin development. Um, um, we're going to start a little bit with fill it with a couple of uh, basic tricks, but I can also fill it with um, how to get from A till B when uh, creating a, a plugin. Um, well, first of all, my name is uh, Jesse Reitsma. I'm um, uh, owner of Yurio, sponsoring also this uh, event. And in my daily life, I'm uh, uh, developing uh, Joomla extensions, Magento extensions, created also a bridge between Joomla and Magento. Um, and actually, coding is what I do uh, for a daily living. Um, now, part of that is that if you're coding, you're coding something, and I'm not coding templates, like uh, the, the web design part is uh, out of my league. Um, but what I do is create uh, Joomla components, Joomla modules, and Joomla plugins. So this whole talk is not about components, not about modules, or not about general um, extension development. It's really specifically about plugins. Um, and that sounds boring to some. Um, uh, some people asked me before, uh, yes or yesterday, they asked me, um, is your, is your uh, presentation going to be basic? And well, my answer is yes, um, but it's go also going to be advanced. Um, how many of you were here at the previous presentation uh, of Phil Bootstrap? Um, cool. What he did was a very excellent thing. He took something which is rather complex, Bootstrap, you can make it, um, you, you can put it in different, uh, different varieties, uh, do a lot of stuff with it. And during his presentation, he basically simplified the whole thing. He made it easier to use Bootstrap, or gave, gave a couple of tricks. Um, ignore the warning. Um, I'm doing the opposite. Actually, um, my, my game, my, my thing is to take something really simple and make it very complex. Um, sounds really stupid, but it's actually challenging to, to get like the technical out of it. Um, start with a basic plugin and then go more, uh, more advanced and uh, more advanced. Um, the plugins I wrote so far are uh, very small. Uh, a plugin, when you develop it yourself, the code base is, uh, is rather small if you compare it to an MVC component. Um, but the real challenge is actually to do something useful with it. So actually when developing plugins, we're not going to focus on the actual code, but more on the brainstorm. What can we do with actual plugins? Why are they there? Uh, how can we apply them in Joomla? And what kind of cool stuff can we uh, create with them? Um, before we get to the actual presentation, um, I'm also writing a book about this. Um, I started it uh, about two and a half years ago. Um, stopped for it w about uh, two years, so I didn't write for two years. Uh, now I'm picking up speed again and trying to finish the book. And the whole challenge is actually like, uh, again, taking something simple and uh, making it rather complicated. So uh, the last chapter I finished was uh, on uh, Finder plugins, uh, Smart Search. Um, so let me first start off with like uh, inventorization of the room. How many of you ever created or developed uh, your own Joomla plugin? Well, that's around half of the room. How many of you created the Finder plugin, so Smart Search plugin? Um, how many of you found it easy to do that compared to creating a system plugin? Yeah, so a system plugin is very easy to create. A Finder plugin, then suddenly you have all these system calls and, well, th there is some documentation, but there's not that much. Um, so my challenge was actually to, well, start with the basic Finder plugin and, uh, well, th the whole chapter on Smart Search is now the largest chapter of the whole book because it's rather complicated and it's a lot of if-else like, uh, hey, but if my component uh, offers search uh, abilities, then it can find or then can, uh, I can add a Smart Search plugin to actually add that to, do the, to the Joomla search functionality. Um, but what if my component is not standard? Then the standard approach of a Finder plugin does not apply, and I have to come up with a lot of tricks and a lot of workarounds to make it, uh, make it work uh, nonetheless. Well, that's um, a little bit covered in my book. What I'm going to do um, during this presentation is more focus on like the basics and also give, give a couple of um, advanced examples of how to create a, a plugin. Um, 
what I mentioned when I was starting with, um, with asking like how many of you created the plugin, the first thing you have to ask yourself is why do I want to create a plugin? Um, it starts off with a need. Well, most of you are web developers. You're, you're probably in charge of either um, developing your own standalone extension and distributing it for free or commercially, or you're building a site. Um, but it all starts with actually a reason, a problem you're going to solve with code. Um, and the whole chapter or the, 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 the first part of my presentation is going to cover uh, what kind of problems are we encountering, what kind of reasons do we have to actually create a plugin. Um, and the issue is a plugin is first of all not a component, not a module. Uh, for how many of you is this a standard thing? like the difference between components, modules, and plugins. Um, that's almost all, uh, but not everybody. I'm just going to explain it in a couple of sentences. A component is the main functionality of a site. So if you're browsing to a page, it's built up by a component. Uh, the modules are just uh, floating around the component. So you have uh, a search bar, you have a menu uh, on the left, um, and that's all based on modules. So if you visually look at a, a Joomla site, you're actually seeing the component and you're seeing the <coughs> modules. What you're not seeing is a plugin. And that's basically where it gets a little bit harder. Because if you have to explain to an end customer what is a plugin then, well then the, the, the description is it's doing something under the hood and we don't actually know how to make that a logical whole. Um, becomes a little bit more clear if we focus on what kind of plugin groups we have. Well, in the Joomla core, all the Joomla plugins are divided into groups, and the groups actually mentions like um, what kind of uh, functionality is contained with a plugin. So, for instance, if I'm logging into Joomla, Joomla has to authenticate my username and my password, uh, and that can be done by using the Joomla user database. Um, for that, I need a Joomla authentication plugin to take my username and password and match it within the Joomla database. Um, well, personally, I built a bridge between Magento and Joomla, so another, uh, 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 another application. So what I did was build an authentication plugin for Magento so that a Joomla username and a Joomla password is matched not with the Joomla user database, but it's matched with a, a Magento database. Um, and that's just one user scenario. There are many more. Um, when content is being uh, prepared for, for display, so when an article is being fetched from the database to put on screen on your website, uh, there are a couple of plugin events that are generated and where your, uh, your plugin can hook into. A system plugin is actually very low level. It doesn't have anything to do with authentication or with content. It's just really on a lower level, the functioning of Joomla itself um, when I'm using, uh, when I'm logging in as a user, or when I'm changing my user record, uh, a user plugin is being called. Um, a JCE editor, the editor, the tiny MCE editor, there are plugins as well. Um, and this is just only the listing of Joomla itself. Uh, when you look at third-party components, um, to name a few, Furtomart, Heika Shop, uh, K2, Zoo, they're all offering also extra additional plugins to make their stuff also extendable using components, modules, or actually plugins. So when we're dealing with plugins, there's a whole set of solutions that we can choose from, but actually the solutions are not that interesting. It's rather the problem that we have that needs to be solved. So we need to solve the, a specific problem, and then we're going to sp choose um, a specific plugin to solve that. Um, I created personally also a couple of uh, plugins, mostly meant for my own um, uh, components. So the, the bridge between Joomla and Magento is called uh, MageBridge. Um, I've got another component called Simple Lists. It's like another CCK, uh, but it's also solving again a specific problem. Um, for instance, you can really easily create a frequently asked question uh, listing with Simple Lists. Well, some people like it, and uh, if they, they want to extend the functionality of Simple Lists, I'm using Simple Lists link plugins, for instance, to link a frequently asked question with a full-blown tutorial on how to use something. Or I'm using a frequently asked question to link to an external site. So the link itself is being generated using a plugin of the type Simple Lists link. Um, 
it was a problem I had that I wanted to have a simplest item that could be easily linked to any kind of external link, so an article, a web link, um, um, a menu item, uh, or even a file or an image, so you can have image galleries. Um, and to solve that, I created my own plugin type. Um, I mentioned earlier Zoo, um, because I actually was also assuming when I started writing the book that Zoo would use also plugins. Um, that's not true, unfortunately. So uh, if you're looking for uh, a way to write Zoo plugins, stop looking. There are no plugins. There are um, something called uh, apps within Zoo. Uh, how many of you are, are familiar with Zoo and the app architecture? Um, and within the apps, um, you can create a content type, for instance, a product content type or uh, a book content type. And within the content type, you have elements, so fields that you can actually um, uh, give a value to. Um, and the whole concept of apps and plugins, or sorry, that's confusing. The whole concept of Zoo apps and Zoo elements is not bound to any specific Joomla extension, but it's their own stuff, their own type of extension they created uh, for that. Well, the list goes on and on, um, but there are a couple of events that are so generic that uh, sooner or later you will bump into them. Um, and to give a preview of, well, more important uh, uh, set of events, a uh, more important set of plugins, um, I take out the user plugins. Uh, every time when a user logs in or logs out, um, Joomla says, hey, there's something happening at this moment. And uh, to allow for plugins to actually do something at that point in time, it triggers an event. So the event is more or less like the, the thing that is happening within the Joomla core. And based on this event, uh, a plugin can hook onto this and use a specific plugin method um, to do something useful with that. A plugin method is based on a plugin class. So uh, you have to know a little bit more about uh, PHP object-oriented uh, programming, but that's counting for the rest of Joomla as well. So you start off when you're developing your own plugin, you start off with defining a plugin class. Within the plugin class, you have a couple of these methods, and then you can start doing your stuff within these methods. Um, what, what could you do, for instance, with an on-user login event? Well, what you can do is uh, log out the user. So what you can do is just make sure that every, per every person who tries to log in is automatically logged out. Now, well, that doesn't make sense, but it shows you like the power that when writing a plugin, you can do something with which is uh, very useful or something which is totally unuseful. Um, on user authenticate, um, that's actually where the story becomes a little bit fake. Um, because I mentioned earlier authentication plugins. So a group of plugins called authentication. There's a group of plugins called user. And there's a user plugin event called on user authenticate. But actually, it's not part of the user group. It's actually part of the authentication group. So Joomla comes up with this system of dividing all these events into groups which makes sense. It makes sense to have, for a specific purpose, a specific set of methods available, and that set is called a plugin group. But actually, that definition doesn't make sense. That def definition is not solid. Um, you can do with it uh, whatever you want. Um, for instance, what I can do is I can create an authentication plugin with user plugin events. Or I can create a user plugin with authentication plugin events. Um, the only thing that you need to worry about is actually at what point in time is my plugin um, defined as responsible for something. So if I have a user plugin and it does something fantastic on the event on user logout, but Joomla <laughs> does not know about my plugin, well, the plugin is never called, so the whole code is pointless. So only when Joomla knows about my plugin these events will be called. But as soon as my plugin is known to Joomla, all the events, all the methods that are in a plugin are known to Joomla right away. Now, user plugins are part of the user logic. So only when Joomla starts to do something with user logic, then all the user plugins are initialized. 
The same with authentication. Only when Joomla starts to uh, authenticate uh, users, only then the authentication group of plugins becomes alive. Well, the same counts for search, the same counts for the editor plugin, um, for most of the groups, except for one, and that's the system group. And I'm not sure if I documented it, yeah. Um, the system events are always called, and it has to do basically with how Joomla works, um, how, the, how the Joomla application is being initialized. But one of the first things that happens with Joomla is Joomla is initializing itself. It's setting up a connection to the database. It's making sure that there's a cache available. It's making sure Joomla is Joomla. And then it calls up for the event on after initialize. And at this point, all the system plugins are initialized. So if you have a system plugin and the system plugin is enabled in the plugin manager, it starts doing stuff. Now, if your system plugin actually contains methods belonging to another system or another plugin group, so for instance, my system plugin, which is initialized right here, is containing a method on user save before, or on user before save, on just now, um, it's doing its work then. So a system plugin basically is always initialized, and a system plugin can therefore contain any event of any plugin group that is out there. So you can even write uh, a plugin for K2 events. Well, it's actually not a K2 plugin, but it's a system plugin. And that's something useful to keep in mind. Um, actually, you can, you can see it in the Joomla core as well. Um, where? Uh, let me come uh, think of uh, uh, an example. Mm. When um, the content is being saved to, um, is that a good example? Yeah. Um, if you have um, uh, the, the default set of plugins enabled, there's also a Joomla content uh, plugin. And this Joomla content plugin uh, makes sure that, that um, uh, basic stuff is being outputted in the right way. Um, no, I'm not using that example. Uh, <laughs> I have to come up with a, uh, an example right on the fly. Um, well, a, a good example of when it is needed is actually when you're modifying forms. I'll come to that later on. Um, I'm also hoping that if I have enough time, I can give you um, a, a real example of a plugin I wrote that is actually modifying the form uh, when you are editing a menu item. So the menu item of Joomla is part of the core, it's part of the menu manager, and the menu manager is generating an event that says, hey, at this point, the menu item form is being generated, and before it's actually being turned into HTML, before it arrives on your, in your browser, you can modify it. And if you can modify it, you can write a plugin, for instance, a system plugin, to actually change the form, uh, remove fields, or more useful, add fields. Um, once that's done, the next step comes that actually the form um, perhaps contains an extra field. And this extra field is um, having a value, but you want to have that value stored also in the database. So if you're modifying a menu item, it has a title, it has an alias, it has um, a, a place in the menu, but suddenly it also has a, a fourth field. And this fourth field does not exist in Joomla itself. So if Joomla uh, sees this, this posted form coming in um, with this fourth value, it doesn't say like, hey, there's a fourth value, I should store it somewhere in the database there. No, it doesn't do anything with it. So to make sure that it's actually doing something with it, you have to tell Joomla again, um, hey, you're trying to save the menu item, you're trying to save content to the database. So I'm using yet another uh, Joomla event to actually make sure that my extra value is stored in the way that I want it to be stored. Sounds a bit fake, but actually it's like you have a couple of problems. The first problem is I want to add my own field to uh, a specific form. And to solve that, there's a plugin event. A second problem is that once the field is being stored to the database, you actually have to make sure that that field is there and the field is being saved in the database. So that's the second problem. And to solve the second problem, we again use uh, another plugin event. And to make sure all these plugin events are there available to our plugin, 
the easiest to do is just make sure the plugin is a system plugin because the system plugin um, is always loaded and always has the ability of all these different um, plugin events. Or perhaps if we if we check the code later on, we can see a little bit more at uh, at uh, how it's working. Um, what's also important with system plugins specifically is that. Um, um, when you want to do something with the application, for instance, uh, when the application Joomla um, is sending out the HTML output back to the browser, um, one thing you could do is modify the HTML. So in the previous talk we discussed, um, or not me but Phil discussed, um, the possibility to have Bootstrap added to your theme. And then somebody else said uh, there was this something theme provider that actually created themes that are not in line with Bootstrap. So you have the Bootstrap code of a component, you have the Bootstrap code of a, 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 of a module, that is fine, that's exactly the way you want it, but then the Joomla template is adding extra HTML that you don't want to be added, or it's moving, uh, modifying HTML. Well, to undo that, you can either contact the something theme uh, company and make sure that's being fixed, there was the suggestion of Phil, and that's the best suggestion. Um, but another way is to create your own system plugin and make sure that the HTML that is being sent to the browser is exactly the HTML that you want to be sent to the browser. Well, to do that, um, the next question comes up, I have to create a system plugin, but which event should I create, or which event should I use to actually do that? Um, well, it's definitely not the on after initialize um, event. And why not? Because the first thing that Joomla is doing is initializing the, the application itself. And just after that, it's calling this event on after init initialize. So when you try to modify HTML at this point, um, there is no HTML yet. So what we have to do is know a little bit more about how Joomla works, at what point in time um, is Joomla actually generating this HTML? And once the, ge the, the generation process is complete, the HTML is there, and then we can start modifying it. Well, in Joomla, um, the, the whole process of gathering all the HTML from different places, and then collecting it into one big chunk, and then sending it to the browser, actually the, the process before it's being sent is called the rendering process. And well, then the name already shows up. We have to choose the on after re render event because on before render is too early. Nothing is rendered yet, so there's no HTML. But if we use the on after render event, the HTML is there and then we can use it. Um, yeah. So actually, the difficult thing about plugins is that you have to choose between a plugin group, you have to choose between um, uh, different plugin events and to know what is actually doing something somewhere in the Joomla application, you actually have to know the Joomla application as well. So it brings us um, at the point of programming where we're not just using Joomla as a framework to build our work on top of it, no, we're actually hooking into Joomla and to allow us to hook into Joomla at the correct way, we also have to know very thoroughly how the Joomla application is working. So it requires um, uh, knowledge of the architecture of, of Joomla itself. Well, that's enough about um, the general concept of uh, plugins. Um, now let's, let's view a couple of use cases um, that might be useful or, useful or might not be useful. Um, we're going we're gonna to show a couple of these, um, these examples. But the first thing we need to do is actually define a plugin. And a plugin is um, nothing more than creating a couple of files in a specific folder. In this example, I'm using the plugin system example uh, folder. Uh, you can create the files there and then go to the Joomla extension manager, uh, hit the discover button, and suddenly your uh, plugin is, uh, is uh, discovered. Um, we have an XML file, we have uh, an empty index.html file, which is always mysterious. Um, there are a couple of languages files. But most importantly, the PHP file is actually containing the work we need to look at. Um, first, the language file. Um, it could contain something simple like this. Now, before I'm skipping to the empty file, 
um, it actually mentions two language files. And one question comes up. Um, I, in my previous slide, I only showed one file or two lines of code. Um, but which file should we use? Well, the difference between these two files is actually that there's a .ini and that there's a .sysini. Um, and when Joomla is generating or when Joomla is calling our plugin to live, by default, it's actually only generating the plugin, including the .sys.ini file. So if you want to have something loaded without you doing something for it, so if you have a description of your plugin that is popping up in the Joomla plugin manager, it has to be in the sys file. Um, once you go into the plugin manager and you open up your plugin, the second file is also being used. So that means actually that um, the second file, so the the second from or the first from the second from below, um, is actually meant for a specific situation where our plugin is being loaded, but not causing like that much trouble on uh, that, that much overhead for the other plugins or the other system um, uh, elements. Um, in other words, um, a plugin description, a plugin title should always be in .sys.ini. What I always do is copy these two lines as well to the other file. Um, but the other files should also be used if you have plugin parameters. Um, these plugin parameters are only accessible from within the edit page of your specific plugin. So only in that specific circumstance should be you be loading uh, the, the second file as well. And that's, well, the place where, to you, where you add parameters. Or if your plugin is doing something on the front end, that's also the place where you put uh, the language strings of the front end. So normally, <coughs> The, f the, the lowest file is only, only containing two lines. The rest of the lines should be contained in the other file. Um, Index.html. Um, I'm not going to into a discussion uh, really about it. It's a requirement of the Joomla extension directory to have this file and it's security. Okay. Well, I think it was removed. Uh, the requirement is removed? Yeah. Cool, I missed it. <laughs> I'm gonna there was a big announcement. Oh, really? <laughs> <laughs> you have to remove it now. So you have to remove it, otherwise it's... It's not a requirement anymore. Cool. Okay. Um, next in line, oh, that's... Next in line comes the XML code. Um, if you're familiar with uh, building your own uh, template uh, or building a component or any other Joomla extension, um, the XML file contains all the information Joomla needs to install your own uh, plugin. So it's actually like the definition file for your extension. And um, while with the template it mentions type is template, now it mentions type is plugin. The group where your plugin is belonging um, is also defined there. So in this case I have a group is content. And that's totally messed up because I'm actually using system here. So that's incorrect. It should be either all content or all system. I'm correcting that later on. Well, the XML code is still not that interesting because it could be just the lines you saw there. Um, it becomes more interesting when we look at uh, the PHP code because that's where actually the, the hacking part starts. That's actually where the problem solving part starts. Um, we start off with a file. The file should contain um, a class. Um, and what do we put into the class? Well, by default, nothing. When we start to move to a specific problem, then we can start adding um, some code to it. So the first problem I'm just discussing is, um, hey, there's some HTML code. Uh, that HTML code has to be changed before Joomla sends uh, the output to, uh, to the browser. Well, to do that, I'm just using the on after render event, like I mentioned before. Um, I'm using a specific Joomla <coughs> call to get the current body. So that's actually a string contain containing all the HTML code. I can do some stuff with it. And once I'm done, I'm setting back the same HTML code into Joomla. And once Joomla says, hey, now I'm ready to send back this, this, uh, this body to the, to, the, um, to the client, it's actually been modified by our system plugin. Um, what comes in between is up to your own imagination. 
So when you're um, covering uh, the whole concept of Joomla plugins and you want to modify HTML, um, this is actually the Joomla part, and all the rest um, of the code could be, well, it could be using regular expressions, it could be using third-party uh, third uh, parsers, it could be using a lot of different things, but it's actually less related to Joomla and more related to what you actually want. Um, what I'm actually also doing a lot of times is, because this stuff is actually not related to Joomla anymore, um, I'm placing all this, these, these workarounds, all these hacks, I'm placing them in a second uh, method, and the second method is being called from the first method. So, um, for instance, I, I create another method uh, in the same class called do stuff, and then within here I say this, do stuff. That keeps the, the method code here very <coughs> clean, and it separates basically the Joomla logic from my own logic. Um, another question would be, if I create um, a new uh, method called do stuff, um, what kind of access parameter do I need? Is it a public um, access um, uh, parameter or should it be private or protected? Well, most of the time I'm writing plugins uh, for specific problems for specific sites. So actually in that case, um, I know for sure that nobody wants to do something with my hack. So then the method is not going to be reused by somebody else. And in that case, I'm just using private or protected. The, the event methods are always public, no discussion. Um, how many of you skip the public part? I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing. <laughs> uh, nobody else? How many of you are adding the public part? More. I think it's like a, a standard to, to be specific about what you're adding and sounds like a good thing. But uh, according to the PHP documentation, it's not required. So, yeah. Uh, I don't think so. Perhaps it's even uh, costing processing time. Because if the public parameter is not there, no, it's just defaulting to public. So, yeah. Plugin ordering is important in this case, I guess. Mm. Because several plugins are yeah. modifying the same thing. Yes. Yeah. And, and then you set that on plugin manager, right? Yeah, exactly. So, what you do in the ordering of the plugin manager is uh, saying that the plugin with the lowest ordering is called first. And if that plugin is calling on after render, it does something perhaps to the HTML. Then if a second plugin comes with a higher ordering number, um, that is called afterwards. Um, and then you have to be careful with like what is the ordering type. You'll be getting the output of the third one. Yeah, the exactly, yeah. Um, and in, in this event type, it's, it's not really that common because well, most of the time you want the HTML to be modified only for specific purpose, but it could be a problem. Uh, there are some other cases where it's very important. Um, for instance, uh, when you're using Ceph URLs, there's the Ceph plugin, and the Ceph plugin is also hooking into the same event, and the Ceph plugin is actually calling this event to make sure that every non-Ceph URL that is still in the document, uh, so is still in the body, uh, is converted anyway. So if you have uh, a third party component that sucks because it doesn't use system or it doesn't use Ceph URLs properly, um, then the Ceph URL plugin is fixing that. But if you're still relying on something else uh, with the Ceph URLs, then your plugin should be loaded later on. Yeah. Good. Well, another example is um, the tweaking of uh, document headers. Uh, so let's say uh, there are multiple versions of uh, jQuery, then writing a system plugin allows you to actually remove the multiple versions of jQuery and only make sure that there's one jQuery version. Or, again, to hook into the presentation of Phil uh, uh, previously, um, if you want to make sure that the jQuery version that is being loaded is always um, a jQuery version from the CDN, you can just hack your stuff in there and make sure that's, um, that's happening. Um, now, right here, I'm using the on-after-dispatch um, uh, event. 
and I'm using it to, um, well, to generate a stupid uh, generator tag in, uh, within the HTML document. Um, if, it goes, if, if your problem has to do specifically with CSS or specifically with JavaScript, so the example of jQuery libraries, um, this is actually not the event you want to use because there's another event called on, on before compile head um, and that event allows you to do exactly that stuff that you want to do, basically the head uh, section of, um, of, uh, of your HTML document. That head section contains CSS and contains J uh, JavaScript and if you want to reorder that or if you want to remove files, then actually the on before compile head method um, allows you to do specifically that. You could also still use um, one of these methods of the jfactory get document class, but that's a little bit outdated. So again, a specific problem can be solved with a specific uh, type of plugin with a specific code. Um, now, one example I was referring to um, earlier. Um, it was not a menu item, but now it is uh, a user form plugin. So um, when a user is editing its own user details, uh, normally it's showing up the username, the password, the email, and some other stuff. If you enable the profile plugin, suddenly a lot of extra fields are shown uh, below that, more besides that. Um, so the profile plugin is actually doing the same thing I'm going to explain here. What it's doing, it's actually allowing the, the user form shown in both the front end as in the back end to, uh, to have additional fields or to have certain fields uh, removed. Um, to do that, we create a user plugin. It could be a system plugin, but well, hey, um, a user plugin is called anyway at this point in time. But funny enough, what you can see is it's a user plugin but actually the method starts with on content, so it's actually a content method. So don't get confused, we're going to add some on user methods as well, but to make sure that we don't need both a user plugin as a content plugin, we're gonna just chuck everything together into one single plugin. Um, well, probably this example is breaking Joomla, because if we have a user form and the name field is being removed, uh, then the controller of the user component is going to uh, complain, hey, there's no user, or there's no name filled in. So that's not the username, but the name itself. Um, so there's going to be a warning. Um, but it's just showing like what can be done. Um, well, that's, that's one slide. I'm uh, going to show you the code uh, in a bit as well. So. Um, I'll, be, I'll come back uh, to that. Um, another type of plugin is the authentication, um, which basically means the Joomla username and password are combined into an array called the credentials, and these credentials can be checked with your own plugin. So you could say, um, well, if every time the password is set to Joomla, uh, the, the authentication works. It's probably not really safe to do that, but it's, again, a nice example. Um, well, to move to the last part of the presentation, um, what, you can s wh what I've shown you before is actually that there's a wide diversity of different plugin methods, different plugins, and different solutions to different problems. Um, so here's a little bit of a brain dump that um, shows you like more aspects of creating plugins. Um, how many of you have created their own component before? Uh, quite a bunch. Um, if you have your own component, the chances are big that you have also worked with your own type of content. So not uh, articles, not something else, but your own field sets, your own fields. Uh, now, if you want those fields to be modified using content plugins, just like the articles are, uh, then you want to add an event to your own component code to make sure any other content plugin is allowed to remove things or modify things within your content. So for instance, if your own content has a field called text, and this text could contain uh, an email address, and this email address is directly outputted on screen, that's like very nice to spammers. 
Um, what we could do is just enable the, uh, the, the content email cloaking plugin, which is already shipping with Joomla itself. And the only thing we need to do to make that work with our own content is to add um, a, a bit of code to, um, to our content. And that's being shown right here. Um, there are a couple of requirements. And these requirements are most specifically mentioned not here. And not here either. No. Uh, most specifically, it means if you have an item, and that item um, uh, is an object from the database, uh, and you put that item into the event called on prepare content, and actually that's another mistake I have to update this slide set. Um, uh, currently, it's on content prepare. Um, so what's happening is actually that um, uh, this, this object is part of the arguments array, and this whole arguments array is, is being fed to this event called on prepare content. And then in this event, we can call plugins. And then these plugins, they receive the arguments array, and within the arguments ar uh, array, they receive the item object. But the item object also contains a parameter called text but they don't know whether the text is the text they should be modifying or the text is something else that they shouldn't be modifying. So to make sure that everything is working as it should, there's um, some naming convention going on that if you want to use content plugins, you should deliver an item which has a text field that is working. If you don't have a text field, but you have a description field instead, you have to copy the description field to the text field, then use the user plugin or the, the content plugin, get the feedback, and copy text back to description. So you need a kind of workaround to make sure that actually your content is being modified in a proper way by these uh, plugins. Um, Well, something completely else is um, I'm mentioning now the, the content uh, events, but it could also be that you're just uh, after your own specific events. Um, well, in the Joomla architecture, the plugin architecture is flexible enough to do or to allow you to do anything you want. So you can come up um, with your own uh, plugin group. So in this case, it's custom. Um, so I can create multiple plugins within the same group custom uh, that do something, well, and it's uh, a method called do something. And then within some other place, I can use the same code I, as I was using before with content plugins, but now I'm just triggering another event, and that event is do something. So what I'm now doing is creating my own plugins, um, creating my own component, and just making sure that the method being call called from the component is also matching the method name in the plugins. Um, and you can come up with any method name, any arguments that come along with it, uh, and that way you can create a component that is very flexible enough to allow third-party developers to create plugins to do stuff again with your own component. So the architecture is basically there to make it very flexible um, so that your own code is not only just uh, a single component with a single purpose, but once you start thinking about it, adding plugins, allows for a lot of flexibility for other developers to do more with your component than you might have thought of. Um, when writing uh, my own plugins, I, um, I, I usually bump into a couple of um, things that I always need to be uh, checking for. Uh, and one thing I'm always uh, checking for is whether the color current application is actually the front end, so the site application, and not the back end. So, for instance, if I'm removing multiple versions of jQuery, um, that's something I really want to do on the front end. But if something goes wrong with that, and my, com my plugin is not working properly, perhaps not uh, one jQuery library is removed, but all jQuery libraries are removed, and suddenly I'm left with no jQuery at all. If I'm doing that in the back end, I can't disable my plugin either, because the whole back end is based on jQuery and is crashing. So to make sure that it's working as it should, always start with a single definition, hey, my plugin is supposed to do only work in the front end, and if so, add this line of code, 
um, somewhere in the top of the method of your plugin. Uh, another check, which is a little bit uh, more difficult, is um, when the, 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 the document being handled by Joomla is not HTML. Normally, you're expecting the Joomla front end to be served uh, as an HTML document, so a web page to uh, the browsers. But there are different types of documents as well. Uh, another type is the RSS document. Uh, and there could be different types like uh, a PDF document, um, an RSS document, as I want to mention, uh, a JSON document. that um, if we have um, a language file, uh, we actually have two language files. Uh, so there's the, the one with .sys.ini and there's .ini. And .sys.ini is always loaded, more or less. Um, now, the big chunks of language uh, strings are actually being placed in this other file, uh, .ini. And if we want to make specifically sure that uh, the language file is actually in our uh, plugin, inside the front end. So you first have to have a reason why your uh, language or your language file should be modified in the front end. But if you really want to, if you're adding HTML code, for instance, with language strings in it, then this simple line of code makes sure that your plugin language file is actually being loaded. Um, if it's not, it's giving out these, uh, these language codes like plg underscore system underscore example and so on. Um, there's still 10 minutes left. Um, perhaps it's good to start first with some questions, if there are, are, if there are any. And otherwise, I'm just uh, skipping also not to the web, but I've downloaded the component or plugin uh, myself to, to show you like uh, some stuff I've created uh, specifically for the JForm part. So where you can create a plugin to modify a form to do some other stuff. Um, any questions? Oh, that's interesting. Um, else? From my head, there, there's um, on after render, and there's uh, a new event uh, that is being called still after that. No, but then, then the uh, HTML output is already sent back to the browser, so that's not the one. I've, I've not experienced it. Uh, anyone else? Uh, but later on, we can uh, open up the laptops and just uh, take, a take a peek to see uh, what's going on. Uh, any other questions? Demo? Um, I apologize for um, the operating system.
and now it's doing something completely unexpected. It's Windows. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now I'm, I'm nor normally working under Linux, um, and Linux is nice for coding, but really bad for presentations. So, um, and now I'm just discovering that that the same counts for Windows. <laughs> but I might have shut it down. I think you've lost uh, the connection. Uh. Okay, yeah. Um, it's showing again. Hmm? <coughs> or shall I, shall I start the? Uh, no. Um, Now, um, I, I told you before about this, uh, this um, uh, package I created, SimpleLists. Um, it's, um, it's making <coughs> frequently asked questions easier for some. Um, what it's doing, it's actually separating a lot of logical things that um, I could have used articles actually to display the content, uh, but I'm not. I've defined my own content type. Uh, every content type has a title, uh, a text, which is like basically the same as an article, but it's also adding a picture and it's also adding uh, a link. Um, now this allows for um, a simple list item to actually um, have a uniform way of <coughs> creating all the images in, in the right way. Well, this was before Joomla 3 or perhaps Joomla 2.5 even, uh, when they came up with um, a specific intro image per article. So now that part of simple lists is actually like obsolete. Um, but still the purpose also of having a plugin that is able to modify my specific um, uh, simple list items so that a simple list item can I either point to uh, an article or it could point to a menu item or it could point to many different places um, allows for a lot of flexibility. Now I'm introducing my own content and um, a lot of people dislike that, so a lot of users have al already asked me, like, well, I don't want your specific content. I want to use Joomla articles instead. Um, and what I want to do is basically uh, load Joomla articles, but then with the benefit of simple lists, then I can click around and create a frequently asked question section out of these articles. Um, so I started working on this, and one of the main things that I first started with was rewrite my current um, setup to make sure my, my simple lists architecture <laughs> is flexible enough to do different things with it. Um, normally, if you go to a Joomla menu item and then point it to the simple lists component, the first thing you have to do is choose a simple list category. So that's a specific content category I've created and it's not an article category. So the next step my users want is actually that they don't want to choose a simple list category. They, no, they want to use um, an article category. So I have to modify the menu item page, the form which is on there, to make sure that not my content is being selected by the user, but the default article um, is being uh, selected. Well, for this I'm using a system uh, plugin. Now, hopefully it's showing up good enough. Um, I'm using a system uh, plugin. Uh, the system plugin has, um, well, dummy call get params, but then the actual work starts with on content prepare form. Oops. Um, on content prepare, prepare form is, um, is actually the method I was referring to earlier. Um, it has two arguments, a form object and a data, op, uh, data array, which is containing the actual, um, uh, the actual form data being modified. So in the case of a menu item, it's uh, a menu item form, and it's actually the menu item data. So I know for sure that it has a title, an alias, but also a reference perhaps to uh, a simple lists category. The first thing I have to do is um, some basic checking. Um, well, for now, um, it could be that some other component is messing up with Joomla too much. So I want to make sure that the form is actually in form. Uh, I also want to make sure that we're working in the back end. 
uh, because in the front end there is no menu manager. Um, also, I want to make sure that uh, the current component is actually the menus uh, component. Um, and now I did also some, some extra um, hacking more or less. Uh, then I'm also viewing uh, the view and the task to make sure that it's not only the menu item manager, but also the menu item manager specifically for menu items. Because you can also edit a menu and add a menu. Um, and that's what I don't want. So with this workaround, I can uh, really be safe that actually my form is only being modified if it's a menu item form. Um, the next thing is a bit more complicated. A menu item can point to an article page. It can point to the front view, uh, for, uh, uh, the front end articles. It could also uh, point to a user login, but it could also point to a simple list component. And only at uh, that point, I want to modify it. So if the menu item is showing a menu item for an article page, that's not my business. I really have to make sure that actually only my component is being modified at exactly this uh, point of time. Well, to do that, I'm just checking for a variable data link, which is always being set. And if it's matching my simple list component, then I know for sure it's actually um, a link to simple list. Well, then the actual magic starts, and that is um, very simple. I'm, um, I have defined uh, an XML file, and I can open up that XML file as well. Um, the XML file only defines like um, a field set and fields, um, like you could also do in a template. You could also do this in a module. You can also do this in a component. It's generic J form code, and what it does is actually uh, add my category ID chooser, so select box. Um, it adds it to the menu item. So actually when this plugin is disabled, there's no input to choose actually a simple list category. So for editing and modifying uh, simple list pages, having the system plugin enabled is also like a core functionality uh, a requirement. Well, last but not least, I also allow uh, other plugins to do, to do the same trick. Um, and this is actually not finished yet, but this is where I was heading to. Um, this plugin is actually making sure that a menu item pointing to a simple list page is actually allowing simple list content to be shown. But the alternative where I'm heading at is actually that I want to have the uh, ability that simple lists, the component, is not showing its own type of content. No, it's showing default Joomla articles. So a different type of content. And to do that, um, I'm going to define, or have already defined, but not published, um, a new type of plugin called uh, the simple list content uh, plugins. Um, within that, I'm going to create a new plugin called the article plugin, which is basically replacing all the core functionality of my simple list component with article functio functionality. Um, and what you can see here is that actually I created my own system plugin to extend the simple list component, but actually I'm now allowing other plugin developers also to allow my system plugin to be extended as well. So it's like using a lot of different plugins to allow, allow for a lot of different uh, functionality to be flexible enough, uh, flexible enough to, to allow for scenarios basically that I didn't, uh, didn't come up with. And with this approach, I'm making it not only compatible or uh, a feature for Joomla articles, but also for CCKs. So a K2 or Zoo plugin could also be created not to show uh, a frequently asked question section using my component, but based on Joomla articles, but suddenly based on K2 items. Well, it shows uh, a bit of the code I've been working on. Um, I have a lot more code, so if you're interested, um, please uh, meet up during lunch or after lunch or these days. Um, and to conclude a little bit the presentation itself, um, hopefully you've learned a little bit about how to create a plugin, how to show uh, or how also to extend it in different ways and to make sure that also um, it's flexible enough and there are some coding standards uh, being met. Um, my coding standards were still not completely correct because I found a couple of mistakes. Um, hopefully these days I will update my slide set on uh, SlideShare. So uh, please don't view the slides now, but in a couple of days. Um, 
Any more questions? And otherwise, uh, thank you and uh, have a great lunch.